Thank you, Mary. Hi, well, welcome you, you all. It's an, it's an honor and it's a challenge for me to host and lead this conversation tonight. As Mary said, I am based in Chile at the top end of South America. And um, I don't want to apologize, but my English is not perfect. And I'm just telling you this because Women X is about feeling safe among women. And you can feel so safe that you can even lead a conversation in another language, language that is not your own. So that's how safe you can feel on Women Next. Um, having said so, um, it's, it's really a, a pleasure for me to guide this conversation about COVID and vaccines and the experience of uh, these prominent women who are in the front lines of science, uh, medicine, and healthcare. Uh, first of all, I will like each of our panelists to introduce themselves. Then I will ask them some of the questions that we have collected from our Women X community members. And this conversation, we hope, will help, help us to better navigate this challenging time where the pandemic continues to take the lives of so, so many people, when cases are on the rise in different parts of the world, and where there are hopes, but also uncertainties about the arrival of the first vaccines. So to start, doctors Ashira Blazer, A.B. Hussein, and Jenny Najah, welcome. Thank you for being here. And the floor is yours in that alphabetical order, if that's OK for you to introduce and present yourself. For sure. Uh, thank you, Paola. Uh, so I'm Ashira Blazer. I am a rheumatologist in New York City, so at the first epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in the United States. Um, I am about 20% clinical, 80% research, so I do research in immunology um, and study lupus as affects people of African ancestry. That said, once the pandemic hit, it was all hands on deck, and so uh, rheumatologists and uh, academicians like me were on the front lines, both in taking care of patients and also on the bench work side. And then as well, I participate in some of the national societies and making guidelines for patients with autoimmune disease uh, with regard to COVID and COVID vaccination. So I will be coming to you with a multifaceted uh, point of view regarding this virus and how to protect yourself and your loved ones. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Abby. I am an infectious disease doctor in Washington State. Um, infectious disease is a huge category. So just to clarify, I specialize in HIV AIDS, um, as well as all other infectious agents that are like bacterial, viruses, fungal, um, mainly do clinical work, but I am technically in my research year. Uh, and so some of my work right now is on herpes virus. And then Kind of as Dr. Blazer mentioned, all hands were on deck for COVID. So I have been participating as a clinician enroller for a lot of COVID trials, uh, including treatment and kind of prevention as well as vaccine work. Um, and so that's kind of what's been taking up my time at the moment. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I've been having, I've gotten a new computer in the last two weeks and it's been a journey. <laughs> Every day is something surprising me. Um, my name is Janina Jeff. I am a population geneticist by training. Uh, I work for a company called Illumina. We create genetic and sequencing technology. And in addition to that, I, uh, and just to, to tell you guys what that is, I mean, for the most part, we create the technology that's used for most of the genetic testing that happens, including genetic ancestry testing. So I actually work in the sector of Illumina that works on um, genetic ancestry testing uh, and screening of healthy populations. And so in addition to my work at Illumina, I also am a, I like to say a, a science communicator or a science journalist now. Um, I have a podcast called In Those Genes, which is a podcast that uses genetics to decode the lost histories and futures of African descendants. Uh, typically, what we like to believe at the podcast is that genetics and science as a whole should be more accessible. And we think one way or one way to make genetics more accessible to the Black community is to use Black culture as a springboard to teach genetics. And so 
and our first season, we, you know, did this, uh, we were, our first season was focused on genetic ancestry testing, as we saw that as an entry point, given the popularity around the test. In the middle of our season, COVID-19 happened, and um, that being an immunologist by training, I do have um, some epidemiology experience, uh, but not an, epi not an epidemiologist um, formally. And the, after COVID happened, you know, several people started reaching out to me, asking me, well, you know, simple questions around the virus and asking us to, you know, really to go deep into explaining a lot of the scientific jargon that was circulating in the news so that there could be a better understanding. And so during that time, uh, I called up my, my sister friend, Dr. Blazer, and was like, hey, we need to do an episode on COVID-19. And so since the pandemic has happened, I've been really focused, uh, in addition to developing the podcast that is about genetics and not about COVID-19, including COVID-19 uh, as a part of our platform to really educate the community and really dispel a lot of fears that our community has around COVID-19. And so using the same approach we do with our regular genetics programming, we have added COVID-19 education to that. And to that extent, we host a community cipher now every other week on Instagram Live and Clubhouse um, focused on COVID-19. And then in the weeks in between, we talk about genetics. And so I would say I'm definitely uh, not as hands-on as the other panelists, but definitely passionate and, and well-versed in the science to talk about it. So thank, thank you for inviting me. And it's good to see some of your faces. Again, I think I can recognize some faces that I saw the last time I was here. So thank you, Mary, for inviting me. Hi, thank you, Janina. The name of the podcast, and it is a great name for a podcast, is In Those Genes for some of you who were who are asking. And uh, there is a link in the, the chat. So my first question is, is uh, for all of you. You, you all come from different areas and from distant, distant parts of the United States, um, and yet you are all in the front line in, in different ways. So could you please tell us what, what you've seen, what you have experienced during this uh, pandemic? Dr. Blazer, could you start? Yeah, so this pandemic has been a wild ride. Um, you know, when it hit New York State, and I guess similar to uh, Washington State, it was in the early times of pandemic, and it was when uh, the supplies of PPE weren't great. Um, at the time, I was doing inpatient rheumatology consults, and the hospital was just filling up, filling up with uh, with COVID patients. And I remember it was just such a surreal experience because those of us who could work from home did. Those of us who needed to be in the hospital were in the hospital and slowly but surely every doctor who could lend a hand was converted into a frontline worker. So no matter if you were a specialist, if you were a researcher, medical students got promoted, fellows got promoted, right? And so we were just really all trying to handle this surge of patients. Um, and at the time, you know, in the hospital, I work in a, a um, public hospital. So a lot of our patients are black and brown. And, um, you know, we would go into the hospital and every day, a new portion of the hospital would be converted into um, a higher level of care. So areas that were not ICU became ICUs. Areas that were outpatient clinic became acute care or inpatient hospital areas. And still, we were just barely keeping a hold um, on the number of patients and, you know, the, the mortality rate was much higher than, um, you know, every 10 minutes we were in the hospital, you would hear a code and that was the sound of someone who was dying of this disease. And, uh, it was just, it was just so emotional because, you know, I would go to the hospital and take care of these patients and hear all of these codes. And then, you know, we have a morgue at the hospital and um, that got overrun. And so we just had these trucks, these white trucks that were like coolant trucks for the excess bodies. And I would walk home because I didn't want to get into anyone's car or subway. So I'd walk from my hospital to Harlem, four miles, clear my mind, good exercise, and also prevented me from having to use public transit. And I would walk between the two hospitals and every day there would be another truck and another truck 
in another truck. And it was just this grim sign of us losing this battle, you know, um, and, and being in a hospital with all these black and brown patients, like these are people who looked like me and we didn't have enough PPE. And uh, I'm thinking, what if I get this or would I bring this home to my loved ones, right? Um, it was just a really scary time. And I think it was, it's been one of the most trying times of my medical career, I would say. Um, watching us come through this, more and more people get it, but also science racing to get this vaccine. Mm -hmm. And the idea that this could come to an end is uh, extremely, it feels triumphant to me, it feels moving to me, um, but it has been a very surreal ride, I would say. Thank you so much. That that's the way it, it sounds. And thanks for, for that description. That it's like, say like we can see the white tracks. That we can see, we can hear the sounds. And and it must have been very 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 tough. It, it's been a tough time. Uh, Doctor Hussein, what would you like to share with us tonight? Yeah, I would say you know as I mentioned, I was not doing as much clinical work this year. But as a research fellow, we as Washington State were the first people to kind of have an actual case of COVID in the U.S. And I think that was honestly it was crazy. Like as soon as that was detected and found out, it was everyone was in this like warp speed, communicating with each other, all the hospitals kind of trying to figure out what to do. And from the behind the scenes aspect, you know, I worked a lot with infection control, which basically is when you're in the hospital, the people who kind of decide what PPE you need to wear, what protection you need to have, how we're gonna isolate patients, who we're testing, so forth and so on. Um, and that was not something I had ever done before, but because there was so many people who needed to be in the hospital and they needed backup to hold these pagers. I mean, we created this system where any COVID question in the area basically came through an infectious disease doctor. Um, and so we were carrying the pager 24 seven um, for the first four months straight. And it was primarily one or two people. And so then eventually we kind of all had to get on board and just figure out how to respond and how to do these things. And so from that perspective, it was extremely stressful, not just seeing the patients, but dealing with colleagues who were trying to work, trying to do like their surgeries, trying to figure out the best way to go about seeing their patients in the safest manner and just really having to kind of deal with that burden and feeling personally responsible kind of for people's safety. Right. Like if you decide that this person doesn't need to wear a mask and they get sick, then suddenly is that on you? And I think that was just such an interesting experience coming from that perspective. I think in the same time, it kind of showed you, it showed me at least, like how quickly the medical community can come together and really share resources in a time of need. We were communicating with hospitals that we don't always talk to, discussing what our protocols for safety were and kind of what they should do and what we think everyone else should do, really while we were waiting from kind of national guidance. But because we had the first kind of episode here, we were like, okay, we need to figure this out and we can't just wait. We have to upscale our testing. We have to figure out how to get people screened. We have to expand all of this stuff. And I think that was just something that I had not anticipated to see so early in my career. And honestly, in a way it was also humbling, right? For people who've practiced for so long, for all the work and all the training that we've done in medicine, it is insane to have something kind of pop up seemingly out of nowhere and remind you that no matter how well practiced you are, you're not always ready to handle every single thing. And we really had to remember kind of what we've learned before and how to utilize our knowledge prior into something that was a completely new realm for most of us. Um, and so that was really scary. I mean, like going to work every day and being like, oh, cool, I have no idea what I'm doing. That's great. Um, so that was really like a new feeling and something that we had to get over as a team and as people. And I think just seeing, I did get end up seeing a couple of patients in the hospital in those early days. And it was just it was wild seeing them not be able to communicate with their family members, honestly, not even really communicate with us. As a specialist, you know, I don't always have to do a physical exam and we were trying to protect that type of contact. So we would see the patients and then other days we would come watch them through the window or talk to them through the phone or some video interface. And it was just a different feeling and you felt almost not disconnected at all, but just like you couldn't be as present as you wish you were. And I can only imagine how much that affected them and their families. I mean, they don't even like us really that much, but their families, they can't see. And just that burden was like a lot to handle. And I think there was a lot of emotional um, and mental health anguish kind of with all the people, no matter how used we are to seeing death as most of us are, it's just, it's not, it's not something you get comfortable with, so. Yeah, sure. 
And probably that's good, no? that we don't feel comfortable in face of, of death. And I think we can all rely on, on this sense of, of, uh, of being scared or not knowing what's going on and not knowing if we're doing the right thing to, to protect our loved ones, to protect ourselves. Well, especially for you, like being part of the, of the health community. Uh, Danina, from, from the first moment, the hopes were in, in genes, now in sequencing the gen genome, like we were, our eyes were on geneticists like you in order to better understand the virus and to try to create this vaccine. What would you share with us about your, your experience? Yeah, I mean, so I tell people all the time, you know, when other scientists battle of like, who's better, the cell biologist or the geneticist or, uh, you know, I always tell people that if you didn't have genetics, you wouldn't have any of those things, um, but whatever. <laughs> um, one of the things that was really exciting from a genetic perspective, and, and this is directly related to a lot of the work that I do, um, people always talk about this fear of the vaccine being developed so fast and, and how did it get a name and all this stuff. This is all due to the genetics. So very early on, I think at the end of January, uh, the sequence of the full SARS-CoV-2 virus was made public. And what I saw was a huge shift. So the first thing everyone did was said, hey, let's see how closely related from a genetic perspective this new virus is to the original SARS virus. And you saw that they were quite closely, uh, quite closely connected, not close enough that you could use the same vaccines that you had developed for that virus for this one, but close enough that it wouldn't take that much to create one, which is why we saw the creation of this new virus so quickly because of all the work that was done on the original SARS. One thing that I think from a, from a scientific perspective that I saw, and especially working at Illumina and seeing how our technology, which is sequencing, enabled all of this work to happen, and now is enabling things like um, like, tra like tracing, right? For example, we also learned, I think, maybe a couple of months ago that the, there were people who got infected with two different versions of the virus. And we can determine that all by genetic sequencing. Um, from my perspective, in terms of the work that has been, been done more recently on the scale of the research. So one thing that I saw that I had never seen before, um, research was already, you know, changing. Like people, uh, scientists were being able to publish their research in a place called BioArchive, where it's pretty much like a medium, you know, anyone can post there, anyone can post, you know, their scientific findings. It's not peer reviewed. You just want to get it out there. And what you've seen is thousands of publications in the matter of months being published on COVID-19. Um, a lot of research initiatives, especially at my, at my job at Illumina, but also a lot of academic institutions really quickly shifted from whatever they were working on to COVID-19 projects. You've seen grant opportunities. You've just seen a dump of research at a pace you have never seen before. Um, and it's exciting because it, it shows you that science and this research can move fast. There are also some cautions around it, right? Because like I said, anyone could just publish a paper in BioArchive and it's not always scientifically reviewed, but we still see a rush in the peer reviewed uh, scientific journals and we've seen a huge shift. One thing that we also saw in the midst of all of this was the ugly parts of our healthcare system, right? We saw very quickly and, and Dr. Blazer and I very early on predicted that there was gonna be a huge health disparity that happened. And when we saw cases progress, we now see, and it's, we now see medical racism in real time, right? We now, unfortunately, are watching the results of years of systemic racism within our healthcare system, you know, now trickling down to actual death and disproportionate deaths in people, or black and brown patients. And so that has been, you know, very sad, obviously, um, but like I said, there has been extreme growth in the scientific community. I'm amazed at all the things that have been done. And to be honest with you, I think this research is gonna continue on for the next couple of years. And so I do see you know, a lot of hope as well and a lot changing in the way that we look at viruses and, and vaccines. Yes, and I think there is hope in this, in this whole picture that you have painted for us, you know, as 
patients were filling up the hospitals, scientists were rushing to trying to find a solution and writing and then doing the research. So it's like both sides are different sides of this process that we were all go were going through and we are still going through. As, as, uh, as we're here together, as I speak, I am preparing to go into lockdown this weekend in Chile because cases are on the rise. And I'm telling you this because it's summer here. It's warm, mm -hmm. it's nice, it's, uh, you know, days are bright and long, but still COVID cases are on the rise and we need to go back to lockdown. And that's also happening in the States. And you're in the midst of, you know, winter, winter is coming and there is a snow and there is a still a rise in COVID cases. And this is happening all over the world, also in Europe. So why, why do you think, why are we seeing this rise in, in COVID cases, Dr. Blazer? Because people are around each other. Um, you know, I just, it's one of these things where we all hoped that this virus would be the kind of virus that is worse when it's cold and kind of goes away in the summer and then comes back and, you know, and this is a thing that we've seen with flu or other cold viruses, um, but that simply is not the case with this virus. This virus will spread when people are around each other. Um, if people are around each other, they're not wearing masks, they're close enough, you know, any sort of droplet or, uh, you know, expelling of viral materials. Um, we'll reach the other person. And on average, if one person is infected with COVID, that person will infect about two other people. So, you know, this is the kind of thing where unless we are really distancing from each other, um, it's just, it's going to spread. And it's not affected by the weather. It's not affected by the season. So I just think that... And, and I think also people are tired, right? Like we've been doing this for a full year and now it's the holidays and everyone wants to be around family and everyone's tired. And, um, and I think, unfortunately, we pay the cost for that. Dr. Hussain? Yeah, I mean, this virus is just rude, right? It's like disrespectful. It doesn't care how tired you are or what season it is or what you're doing or who you're with. It's just looking for a moment for you to let your guard down and then it's gonna just kind of rear its ugly head. And I think kind of a lot of what we were saying is this quarantine fatigue, right? Like we know that being isolated and not being with loved ones can cause a lot of mental health strain. Um, and that is a balance that we've had to try to make this entire year but you can only balance for so long when something tips. And I think a lot of that is the fact that people are just not being as cautious as they used to be. They're not being as vigilant because they're tired. And a lot of the times I also hear, you know, people are less scared, um, which is interesting because we see that the cases are rising and hospitalizations are rising and we're terrified. But sometimes at a certain point when you are waiting for something to happen to you or someone close to you and it doesn't, you kind of lose that urgency, you lose that edge and you start letting that mask slip below your nose. You know, you start washing your hands less. You start thinking, well, I can have a small dinner with five people. They've all been kind of quarantined for a couple of days, we'll be cool. But, you know, we've seen that a lot of our outbreaks or our small groups come from people hanging out with family members or close friends and that spread because you are, your guard is down and your mask is no longer on. Um, and not that none of this is understandable, but it is super important even now with vaccines that we maintain that masking and that social distancing to really give ourselves a chance to kind of make it over. Like we're so close and it's just hard to feel that we're slipping backwards because all of us are tired. Um, but I think this is an important time to kind of bring back that energy that we had in March and really just try to hold things down. Thank you so much. Uh, Janina, I would like to ask you the same question, but also ask you about these um, ideas or theories uh, like about different strains of the virus that the virus can change or mutate and we feel like a scare in face of those of those words. Maybe not you because you work on chains, but uh, what do we know about that? Is, is this, how would you explain this? Right? Yeah, so I think, I think there are a couple of things to, to take into perspective when we're talking about uh, viruses and, and how fast they mutate we have, they mutate at different rates, right? So for the flu, for example, it mutates very, very fast. With this virus, it does not mutate fast. And it also doesn't mutate in a way where you have completely different 
uh, like you don't have differences in the type of virus that you will get, right? So for example, there has been different, uh, there has been some differences in COVID within COVID-19, but none of them change the clinical representation of COVID-19, right? None of them are changing anything unique enough where you would see a completely different virus or a rise of a virus. And everyone's like, well, what if it mutates? Will the vaccine still work? The way that the vaccine is being targeted, it's targeting a region of the, of, of the, um, of the virus that has not mutated, that is not changing. Uh, when we talk about mutations, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, if we talk about the differences between each other, we're 99.9% .9 the same, and there's only 0.1% of us that account for like these mutations or differences that look different between us. And so if we're thinking about the virus, it's the same thing, like in that context, there's a really small portion of it that is changing, but it's not really changing the fact that it's still SARS-CoV-2. Just like us having these differences don't change the fact that we are human. And so you don't see really drastic changes with SARS-CoV-2. And also the mutation rate is a lot slower than something like uh, the influenza virus. Uh, the first question that everyone else was asking, oh, why are we having a rise in cases? Um, and I'm gonna say a little different opinion about that. Well, I, obviously everything that everyone else said, but I just wanna emphasize, we would not, we us going through this right now is very political. Um, there are countries who are not going through this right now. There are countries who did not have 300,000 deaths, right? And that's because at the very beginning, they listened to the scientists, literally listen to the scientists. And throughout, throughout, like Taiwan, for example, I was reading a woman's blog who went there. And, you know, as soon as she arrived in the country, she had to stay locked in this hotel for two weeks. She had to be tested every day. She had to give them access to her cell phone so that they could trace her. You know, all of these things that have kept the case rate, they haven't had a case in weeks, not a single case. And they're living their lives just fine. Um, you know, we made some really poor decisions in the beginning. That's why we see rises. We haven't socialized the importance of social distancing, given the fact that we didn't act on testing, given the fact that we didn't believe that the virus was even spreading. You know, we, we shut down probably a month too late. And by that time it got out of control. And then we also opened up when we, you know, we had no business opening up, right? Uh, we hadn't, we hadn't, we haven't really confined the virus in any way. And now I saw, I, I think I saw a tweet or something on my phone. So go back and check it. Lateral reading for everyone. Everything we say, always go back and, and find a bunch of things to, 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 to lateral read on. But um, one of the things I saw was that, um, that apparently now, you know, the Trump administration in the beginning always wanted herd immunity. And for those of you who are not familiar with herd immunity is when enough people become immune to the virus by develop, by even getting the virus or having a vaccine that you don't, you, you stop the spread of the virus. And so I personally think the reason why we're seeing the rise in cases, the reason why we've had so many deaths, the reason why all of this is happening is really just poor decisions, not listening to the science and even the way we socialize it in our mindset around it in the very beginning is really shaped what we're going through right now. Yeah, to your point, Danina, of course, we have New Zealand, like zero cases yeah. of COVID-19, but we also have Germany. Yeah. And I think Germany faced the virus in a united way, a good leadership, and they are still on the, on the rise. So I don't want to diminish the political point, which I think is it's really important because the United States, as we see it from the outside, you have all the resources and and honestly, I thought you know that you will do a great a great job. And I mean, not you, but authorities, and that's not the case. But but we also have the case of Germany. How do you how would you explain that? There is like a mix of things. I mean, I think a large part of it has to go um, with culture. A large part of it is explained with the culture there being, I think, and I could be wrong, I don't know enough about German culture. I have friends who live there, um, but 
the way people are united there is a little bit different. Here you have a lot more different perspectives. We saw with the election, right? We are divided as a country. And I think one of the reasons that we are so divided, one of the reasons why people don't want to believe scientists is because we've also made science and medicine an elitist thing. And elitism right now is very, you know, associated with these radical liberals, right? All of that plays a narrative of how people take and think about the virus. I don't, I don't even know if I believe that think that people really think that it's not a thing or people really think that the vaccines are, I mean, I think that that's true that a lot of people have fears about that. But I think more of the fear is that, well, why do I want to listen to these elite scientists? And we've kind of culture, we, our culture has made these things inaccessible which completely turns off the rest of the population, right? If we continue to make science and medicine, and even when we're talking about the virus, if we continue to make it inaccessible for people who are not scientists and people who are scientists only look this way and only speak this way and only have these degrees, we are you know, excluding a lot of information and there's no trust there. And I think it's shaped by capitalism and I think it's shaped by a lot of things that now collectively we're seeing a big storm and it's all coming together. I mean, 2020 has been the perfect storm in so many ways. We have a global pandemic, we have a racial uproar. And because of these things, now we're affecting you know, parts of our um, uh, parts of our economy. And when you start touching on those things, you bring up a whole bunch of other issues. And so I don't know exactly enough about the culture in Germany, but I know the culture here is shaped largely around, around these things. And I think it's had a tremendous effect on how we've handled the virus. Sure. Thank you. I would like to ask you about, you know, there are some questions about vaccines and I want to go right into that area because uh, as we speak, there is a huge effort to vaccinate against the COVID. Uh, health personnel are on the front line. The UK and the United States are uh, vaccinating uh, people after the emergency approval of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, you'll get the shot very soon. And, and I would like to know how, how do you feel? Like how, how your family, your friends, your colleagues react when you tell them that you will be vaccinated. How is the reaction? Yeah, um, I get it on Monday at 9.30 a.m. Not like it's bolded, highlighted, underlined in my planner or anything like that. Um, I'm very excited. I'm also very privileged to be part of the group that gets it. And I think even that discussion itself, deciding who is going to be getting it first was a huge ethical dilemma in like multiple ways, right? But the thought was to preserve the workforce to be able to better provide for those who come in the hospital. Um, and to see what we can do in that sense that we stay strong and kind of useful, basically, honestly. Um, but I'm excited about it. Most of my friends and colleagues are also in medicine. And so they're also excited and likely simultaneously getting vaccinated. Um, my parents are not. And they were super hesitant in the beginning, not hesitant to get the vaccine, but were just nervous kind of for me. And um, their fears are similar to a lot of other people. The fact that a vaccine has been made so quickly, you know, they were worried about safety and whether corners were cut. And for them, you know, every time I have this discussion, I like to frame it in the sense that if you were living in a community and you had 10 houses that were being built at the same time, your house is obviously gonna take a while because there's nine other houses being built with you. But if everyone else building those houses decided that for some reason you were better and they were all gonna focus on just your house, your house is gonna build, get built way quicker. And not because of lack of like foundation, your foundation is going to be stable. It's the same people who are building all the other houses, but simply because all the resources and all the time were redirected to you only, and you were the main focus. And that's how I like to think about the vaccine production that we've seen is that it's not so much people are cutting corners, not at all, actually. We've gone through all the same safety um, and trials and all of that, but more so that for one time, because it's such a huge pandemic, everyone was focusing and sharing and using their resources to do one kind of common goal. And that's how we ended up to be where we are now. So that being said, that's typically how I explain it to them. And now they are on board and excited for me and a little jealous, um, but you know, we'll see. And hopefully as we kind of go on, we can get more and more vaccines and start vaccinating people in like their order and all of that stuff. So I'm excited. Dr. Blazer, I imagine you too will receive the vaccine soon. and. And could you describe which are the expectations in your environment, the expectations that you see uh, regarding the vaccine? Uh, have you seen, I guess, hope 
but also maybe some fear of cutting? Yeah, so I I'm, I don't have a schedule yet, which I'm actually upset about. <laughs> but you know, I, the the idea is that I will get a vaccine in the next couple of weeks. Um, they, you know, my institution is very large, and there's priority uh, they're prioritizing people who are in the ICU and ER and people who are older and all these things. So, um, but I'm thinking probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, that said, I'm very excited. Uh, the response from my family is very mixed. My father is very excited. He can't wait to get vaccinated. My mother is very hesitant and she wishes that I would wait, right? Um, so it's really, really interesting. I feel like, you know, in some circles, people are more afraid of the vaccine than they are of the virus. Um, one of my really good friends, who's also a physician, uh, his family did Thanksgiving and half of them ended up with COVID. And then they messaged him and they were like, hey, are you getting the vaccine? And he said, I already got my first shot. And they said, okay, we'll wait to see what happens to you. And he's like, you guys got COVID, <laughs> right? Like, it's really interesting. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it just speaks to the amount of mistrust that people have for the system. Um, but I am trying to explain to people that this vaccine is very safe and effective that there are reasons why uh, it could be produced in such a short period of time. And in fact, you know, during the Obama administration where there's a task force related to preparing for a pandemic, uh, one of the things that they wanted to tackle was the fact that it took seven to 10 years to get a vaccine to market. And so they actually outlined a plan to be able to produce a vaccine in 18 months. And so this is the implementation of that plan with even a little bit more time shaved off for a couple of reasons. One, for the reasons that Dr. Hussein said, um, we just, it was just all hands on deck, this one thing. And two, because we've seen viruses that are similar to this. We've, this is SARS-CoV-2. That means we've had SARS-CoV-1. That means, you know, we've had MERS, right? So those viruses are in the family of this virus. And so a lot of the upfront scientific work, testing in animal models, things like that had already happened. So, you know, we were well positioned to be able to develop a vaccine. Uh, we had all the resources, all the best minds doing it. And in fact, all of the phases that you need for a vaccine, uh, to Dr. Hussein's point, uh, were completed the way that you would expect. Um, so I'm just trying to educate my friends and family about that process and hopefully be able to cut through some of the skepticism. Uh, that said, I'm, I'm extremely excited. I cannot, I cannot wait to get this vaccine. Like I will be offering both arms and a leg and whatever else they need <laughs> to give me this vaccine. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and thanks for all the questions and comments that you're sharing on the chat. I will try to, to read them and share part of this. Uh, there is a, a question for, for Janina from Dr. Irie Rimina. I hope I pronounced it. Okay, so she asks, how can we dismiss, dismystify the danger of the vaccine from Pfizer? Which of the vaccine is safe for black women? I actually think Ashira should answer that, but I'm happy to. Ashira, do you want to answer it? Or you can both answer the question. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the part specific to Black women. And what was the first part? How can we dismystify the danger of the vaccine from Pfizer? I'll speak on the Black woman and I'll let Ashira speak specifically about Pfizer and their vaccine. Um, so when we say, when we start to um, group people like Black and White and Asian, um, those categories actually, you know, are social categories, right? We've created them. They're not actual real things from a scientific perspective. I told you that the SARS virus, I told you about the genome, about the SARS-CoV-2, about SARS-CoV-2. And so we need that genome in order to build a vaccine. If we were to build a vaccine that were particularly only safe in one population and not another population, we would need to know everything about that population's genome, right? Like I said, all of us, we look different. This is a very beautiful Zoom full of lots of hues and beautiful faces, right? And there's only 0.1% of us that's different. I would need to know the 1% that's only shared in Black women. But like I said, since that's a social category, that doesn't really 
pan out into just this one little place, this one little target that I can go in the lab and create a vaccine to particularly work for one person and not another person, right? When we talk about genetics, the variation is so random throughout the entire genome. We're talking about billions of like little letters that make up the genome. It would be impossible for us to create that sequence in such an organized way in the way of, for a vaccine to only work for one person or another, or to be formed as a bioweapon to hurt one group or another group. So when we talk about um, other questions that we should be asking that are not about being a black woman, or let me say this right, not about the ethnic part of being a black woman, but is more around the social political part of being a black woman, is are we looking at patient populations that we typically see with black women as a result of a lot of systemic racism within the medical system, right? Or a lot of things like capitalism that affect things like the type of diet and environments that we live in that also contribute to our health. And we're, we should be asking the question of people who present these same health conditions who live in these same environments, is the vaccine safe for them? And I will tell you, just like Dr. Hussein said, and I hope I said that right, um, just like she said, she, uh, the, 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 the vaccine trials have tested a lot of these things, right? And so they've tested people who are already sick. They have tested black women. They have tested, you know, as much. And actually, if you look at the demographics, the demographics, and let me also say, we don't see representation that is so reflective of the actual population almost ever. Um, it's, it's so, the representation in these trials really does mirror what we see in an American US population in terms of diversity for the most part. And so that is really big, right? So that means that this, this vaccine has been tested in black women, it's been tested in other women, but I just wanna make sure we understand that it's not about what we socialize as being a black woman that could be the reason why something may or may not work, nor is it possible for someone to design something like that could be targeted for one group of people because these racial lines we've created, they're not real scientifically. Perfect, this is a very selfish question that on that basis, on the same basis, the Pfizer vaccine is safe for anyone around the world. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the Pfizer vaccine. So again, this trial was conducted in 44,000 people. Um, it's two thirds of the people got the vaccine, one third did not get the vaccine. Uh, there were no significant safety signals. There were only 11 adverse events. Um, nine of them happened in the placebo group. Two of them happened in the vaccine group and they were related to getting the virus, but between the time that people got the first dose and the second dose. Uh, for And this, this was a multinational study. It included groups of people of all backgrounds, all age or ages. The original cohort was ages 18 to 55, and then they expanded the age range to include people as old as 70 and as young as 16. So this is true across the spectrum. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that there were there were not safety signals. That said, um, now that the vaccine is being rolled out, there have been some reports of allergic reactions. And so there's an idea that uh, people who have previously had allergic reactions, especially to vaccines, like serious allergic reactions, um, may be more uh, likely to get an re allergic reaction to this vaccine. Um, after you get the vaccine, there's a 15 minute period of time where you have to be monitored to make sure that you don't have an allergic reaction. This has been reported uh, in three people. So that tells you of the hundreds of thousands of people who have gotten this vaccine, uh, this is a very rare side effect. So by far and away it's safe. And I think the other thing that people have to think about is when we think about safety with regard to a vaccine, it's always a cost benefit analysis. Safe compared to what, right? Without a vaccine, we have seen 300,000 deaths in the US. We have seen people recover from this virus and have chronic health issues thereafter. You know, the, we've seen long hospitalizations, medical bills, our economy has been brought to its knees, right? So, you know, when we think about safety, 
the alternative is a fair probability that you'll actually get COVID, which can cause death, right? One thing that we have not seen with this vaccine is excess deaths. So, you know, I think we all have to put things in perspective. Um, but yeah, this vaccine is, has been shown to be very safe across many different groups of people. Dr. Hussain, you work as a, as a clinical enroller. So I would like to, to share part of that experience. And I would also like to ask, and this is maybe a question for all of us, what are, what are people afraid when they have some concerns about the vaccines? By the way, what are they afraid of? What are they thinking is gonna happen? Yeah, so a lot of these questions came up originally when I was doing the treatment and prophylaxis trials and kind of before we even got into this vaccine realm. Um, but I think one of the things we already highlighted uh, was the fact that people were afraid of just kind of the speed and the creation and all of that, which I think everyone covered really well. Um, and I think the other concern is the fact that, you know, we frame this thought process that the people have a lot of mistrust in the health field and the healthcare and medicine and all of that. But I think by framing it as mistrust, we are putting the onus on people when the onus should really be on the healthcare system. As a healthcare system, we have been untrustworthy in the past. And so we are not always deserving of that trust. And I think that is the thing that we have to break down and we have to really take that onus as a medical field and figure out how we can breach those gaps that we ourselves created by doing things in the past that were incorrect and unethical and so forth. Um, so I think that's one thing. So I like to frame it in that sense. Um, but two people are worried about side effects. Like what is gonna happen to me if I get a vaccine? Um, and I wanna point out that vaccines are basically the safest intervention that we consider because it is something we give to healthy people, right? Like you don't already have a problem. We're not treating something that has occurred. We are trying to prevent something from occurring. So from that standpoint, we find vaccines really safe. And most effects that you see from vaccines are gonna be in that early period of one to two weeks or three weeks. The fact that these trials have been following people for two to three months now, if you are counting Moderna and Pfizer, um, the likelihood that you're gonna have a significant adverse effect after that three month period is really low. That being said, because we're not 100% sure of anything, as I'm sure everyone has realized during the pandemic that science changes consistently because we are working and progressing towards truth and towards what actually works, is that we are still gonna follow up people for two years to see what the effect of those vaccines are. Now, we won't have a group that wasn't vaccinated because at this point it's unethical to not offer a vaccine um, that is available if you become you know, eligible to get it. Um, but we will see the effect of those, these vaccines that we are doing and watching it for a long period of time. Um, and so I think that is a lot of the concern that people tend to have. Um, I think that is mainly it. I also already lost track of the question, but I think it was about safety. So, um, and what other, what my patients were concerned about, but that was basically it, basically safety. Do they trust what's being given? Is it actually gonna help them? And I think that the other common thing I heard was, well, why do I need a vaccine for a disease that doesn't kill that many people? And if you get it and you're fine, why do you need to be vaccinated? And my answer to that is that we know that you may have partial immunity for about a three month period. That's what our studies have shown us so far once you get the, the infection yourself, but that's about it, right? And we want long-term immunity. Now, granted, we don't know 100% how long immunity from these vaccines will be, but most things that we have vaccines for can last for years. Sometimes you need a booster, sometimes you don't need anything. And so we feel that these vaccines are gonna give you that longer immunity and we want everyone to get them regardless of whether you had COVID or not. There is always the option if you were recently infected to wait three months because you're kind of protected those three months, right? To allow for other people who have no immunity to get a vaccine, not because of a safety concern. So even if you have COVID, we haven't seen any people have issues with getting the vaccine despite the prior, the prior infection. So um, just some things. Perfect. So uh, could, could you explain maybe, maybe Janina, maybe Dr. Ten, how the vaccine, Dr. Blazer, Dr. Hussein, uh, how the vaccine, how the Pfizer vaccine works? Because it's a different kind of vaccine. No? It is, uh, what is mRNA, which is the, the, this concept that we've been talking about and, you know, we hear it on the news and on the radio, it's mRNA. So how does the Pfizer vaccine works? Yeah, I can take that. So, um, so uh, this mRNA, so I'm going to talk about what mRNA is, and then I will talk about why this is used as a vaccine um, candidate. So, okay, so I don't know if you guys remember 
basic science from when you were in grade school, but in case you don't, um, you know, there, there is, all of our bodies have DNA, right? So your body is just a collection of cells. Uh, and in those cells, there's a middle portion and that is the nucleus. And in the nucleus, there's DNA, okay? So DNA is where all of the genetic information in your body is uh, coded, right? So imagine it like a big recipe book. All right, so these are codes for certain proteins. But in order for us to get to proteins, we have to go from DNA, uh, we have to uncoil the, the big book and just look at the specific recipe that we want. Uh, and then we have to code that into mRNA, which is sort of this middle step. And that mRNA can leave the nucleus. It's like a little uh, message that leaves the nucleus and it goes to a protein factory called a ribosome, right? And then the ribosome converts the mRNA into a protein, right? So this is called transcription and translation. Okay. So this vaccine is a little bit of mRNA, which is genetic material. Um, that's that middle step. So it is literally the code for a certain protein. It can be made into a protein by your body's own protein factory, the ribosome. All righty. So when we talk about um, ways that you can make a vaccine, essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to um, give the immune system enough information so that it can make a response to the most important portion of a virus, all right? So um, I always give the example of like a rudimentary vaccination. Like when I was a kid, there was no chicken pox uh, vaccine. So what happened was my cousin got chicken pox and we were all really young and my mother put us all in the room with my cousin because she knew that when we were kids, we our immune systems were strong enough to be able to take care of chicken pox. Maybe we get a little sick, but like we'd all get over it. And after we took care of it the first time, our immune system would know what that virus looked like and we'd be protected for the rest of our lives, all right? That is, I got exposed to an active virus and I got sick, all right? So between, so if you put that at 10, actually getting sick with a virus, there are a number of steps before that, all right? So some vaccines are, we're gonna give you a weakened form of a virus. That would be like an eight. So we're gonna weaken the virus, give it to you, your immune system can make a response to it, right? Some vaccines are, we are gonna give you a killed form of the virus. So it's a virus, but it's dead. So it can't affect, infect you at all, right? That would be like a six, right? Some vaccines are, we're gonna give you a little piece of a killed portion of a virus, right? That would be like a four, right? This vaccine is, we're gonna give you just the genetic code for a piece of a killed portion of the virus. All right, so we're at a two. This is something that is not even close to live virus that can infect you. However, it allows your body to take that genetic code, change it into a protein. Your body says this protein is foreign and then it's gonna make a response to it. So it actually turns out to be one of us, like the safer methods for making a vaccine. Um, one, because you're so far from live virus. Uh, and two, because if you're making that genetic code in a lab, it is very, very cookie cutter, right? It's something that you can control. Like say someone's giving you a vaccine and it's like a virus that they weakened, right? They grew it up in a lab. We think we got what we think we got. We think it's weak enough. You know, it's not as easy to control, but this is, I know exactly the sequence that I need. I'm giving you only this. I'm giving you cookie cutter copies over and over again. And this is what it is, right? So it's a very well controlled way of giving you just the minuscule amount that your body needs to be able to make a response. Wow, that's a I love that. <laughs> I, I like reading the comments. Everyone is now scientists. Everyone understands. <laughs> If you don't know a lot of the stuff that Ashira explained is a concept we call the central dogma. And so this is a part, the mRNA is a part of the central dogma. I was just going to add, um, we in our episode, in our COVID-19 episode, we explained this uh, using analogies similar to what Dr. Blazer just used. And I saw a tweet yesterday that sounded very close to the analogy that we had. We use an analogy that the mRNA vaccine is like 
showing your body a picture of the virus on Instagram, but like you've never met the person, right? So it can see it, you recognize who they are. You see these people on Instagram, you know what they look like, you know who they are. You can put a face to a name, but you've never met them before. And then someone on Twitter said, mRNA vaccine is like sending your body an email with instructions on how to kill the virus, but then the email miraculously disappears like a Snapchat message. So <laughs> I think another thing to be, to be um, another thing to, to make aware, because I think I saw a question in there about, you know, I'm worried about the long-term effects and, and I'll let others talk about those, but the actual vaccine is not staying in your system very long. And so just like this analogy, it will not be there for a long period of time, right? Yes, I think there are some comments on the chat and I think this is, there is this very beautiful comment that this is part of building trust, like having scientists break down the information so that we can understand the science and not just the outcomes is what Tiffany wrote. And I think it, is, uh, it, is, it goes to the point of what you were saying before, like we need to, science needs to be here with us. We need to understand the way things work because that's the better vaccine against fear and disinformation and misinformation and conspira you know, conspiracy theories and all of, all of that. Now, all, not all of the vaccines work in the same way. So maybe you could help us to uh, make this. Which are the difference between the Pfizer, the Moderna, the AstraZeneca, the Johnson & Johnson vaccines? Which are the main difference? I don't know which one of you would like to take that, that question. I think you're all so well prepared to answer it, but... <laughs> yeah? I feel like I've been talking too much. Maybe, yeah. Dr. I mean... Yeah, so I don't think you've been talking too much at all. I think you clearly know what you're talking about. Um, briefly, since I am not as well versed as all vaccines, but so Moderna and Pfizer are both mRNA. The difference between, and they're both two dose vaccines, the difference between the two of those is that their kind of outer component, lipid, which is basically the way they're kind of getting into the cell, is a little bit different. And so for that reason, the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored at a different temperature compared to the Moderna vaccine. And that's in the structure of both of those. So similar mRNA, but the outside part is a little bit different. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine is an adenovirus, which adenovirus is another type of respiratory virus. Um, and adenovirus pieces have been used in prior vaccinations. Uh, and so that one is also based on a two-dose series. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is a one-dose series, also adenovirus. Um, but they are also in the process of trying two doses too, actually, as well. Um, so that's a little bit of a difference there. And then there's other ones that are kind of coming. So Novavax has a vaccine coming out, and that's a protein-based, um, so different from the mRNA, but more of like a protein unit. Um, and that one is also a two-dose. So most of these that are coming out are two-dose-based. And then there's a lot of ones that are in phase one trial still. Um, I would actually say one of the things that I use to kind of keep these vaccines in track and to pay attention is the New York Times. Um, COVID vaccine tracker. And I think a lot of the comments that were made is that medicine has to be broken down. And I absolutely agree. I think that is part of our untrustworthiness. The fact that we don't explain things so that people can't understand them and they can't make informed decisions for themselves and their families. And that is a huge disservice to everyone because who we are trying to serve is the people. And if the people don't understand what we're trying to do, then really what is what are we doing, right? Um, so I think breaking down that transparency and trying to have conversations and where we can actually explain things like, I understood mRNA is way better now. I mean, I thought I knew them, but now I really have that breakdown in my head. And I think that is something we can all kind of learn from going forward. So I would say those are simply like, those are the differences between them. Both AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson um, have had different kind of outcomes. I think the efficacy for the AstraZeneca vaccine was about 70%. Um, Johnson & Johnson's results won't be out probably until the end of January, but we'll have a better idea. And Novavax is gonna start enrolling towards the end of December. Um, and then there's a lot of vaccines being used in China and Russia that have not completed their phase three trials, but have already been in use. Um, and there are arguments of obviously the safety of not waiting for a trial to be complete, um, but those are limited uses in those places. So one question, do you, do you think there will be a point when people will have uh, a choice like which vaccine take? Or are yeah. we so, oh. so far away from that? <laughs> um, Dr. Blazer, you can go ahead. 
I don't, I don't think so. Um, I actually asked this when we were, when our hospital was rolling out the vaccines and we're all like, oh, they're going to be multiple vaccines. Do we get to pick which one? And uh, basically our administrators were like, no. <laughs> they're like, well, I mean, their idea was that all of these vaccines are going to be approved. Um, whichever one is going to have the data and there's going to be a limited supply. So, you know, it's going to be very much first comes first serve you get the one that you get. Um, that said, um, I, I personally am partial to the mRNA vaccines um, for the reasons that I discussed. And then also because the AstraZeneca vaccine, as uh, Dr. Hussein said, is an adenovirus. So basically it's an adenovirus that usually infects other primates. So it's like, it's one that doesn't usually cause humans to get sick, but they've sort of changed it so that it can present parts of the coronavirus to our bodies. So it's like a virus that can't make us sick, but can give us information about the virus that we want to fight. And that's how um, we end up building immunity. I think the problem with that is that an adenovirus is a kind of virus that causes the common cold. Um, and so a lot of us have had adenoviruses in the past and have been made immunity to adenoviruses in the past. And so I think what's going to end up happening is that um, that 70% efficacy is going to be because, you know, some people are going to get the vaccine and their immune systems are like, I know your game, adenovirus, and they're going to like take it out real quick, right? And then you're not going to end up having the same immune response um, that you expect. Um, so I believe that's probably the reason why there's a difference in the efficacy. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how the, those trials turn out. Um, but I suspect that the mRNA vaccines are going to be a little bit more efficacious. Okay, there's a, an interesting question here from the chat from uh, Chris, Kristen. And why do vaccines offer longer immunity than contracting the virus, the virus itself? I think you have addressed, you have under, explained a little bit of this, but but how or, or why? And I want to say that the option of each one of us contracting the virus and then, you know, reaching this herd immunity is so dangerous. You now it's what some countries have tried that and the result is a high number of, of deaths. So, but I, but I still would like to know why is it, is it, why vaccines create this longer immunity than getting COVID? I don't know who would like to ask that question. Maybe, uh, maybe Danina? I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> so, I mean, I know for one thing, one thing I do, I do know, I'll just talk with, I do know, and then be very honest so that obviously I'm not an immunologist. Uh, one thing I do know, which is a big question is that no one knows how long this vaccine is going to work. Um, and just like what um, we was said earlier, we didn't know how long, you know, immune, how much you would be protected from the virus even after getting the virus. And so the question of how well this is going to work, I think is still up in the air. Um, but to think about other viruses and the history, actually I'm trying to think of other viruses or other viruses where the vaccine is more effective than getting the virus itself for a prolonged period of time. And I don't know enough to answer that, but I just want to say that we don't know how long this virus, we don't know how long this vaccine is going to work. No one does. Even the clinical trials haven't been long enough. Um, so that's my, that's my two cents. Yes. So I think a lot of this is theoretical, so, um, but when you think about, so when a virus infects you, its number one goal is to survive and keep being able to infect other cells, right? Um, many different viruses have evolved to be able to better uh, dupe our immune systems, right? So, you know, this vaccine is literally just, let's teach your body to respond to the portion of the virus that allows it to get into your cells, right? Those are neutralizing antibodies. Those are immune proteins that attack the right part of the virus, all right? When you get infected with a virus naturally, a number of things happen. First of all, you get infected with a whole virus and your immune system is like, I'm not sure which part of this is important. I'm gonna make antibodies to all of it, right? 
not all antibodies are created equal, right? If you make antibodies to the right part of it that prevents it from infecting you, good for you, you've made neutralizing antibodies. But there have been studies, um, especially blood bank studies. So looking at people who just donated blood during this period of time and uh, looking at the antibodies that they had. So um, in that study, about 10% of those samples had antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, but people made antibodies to all kinds of parts of the virus. So, you know, parts of the virus that are not important for infection, parts of the virus that are important. And only about half of them had these neutralizing antibodies to the right part of the virus, right? Um, the other reason is that the virus has evolved to be able to change the way that our immune systems respond to it and therefore give it a better ability to survive. So, you know, whenever we get infected with something, our immune system, which is just a collection of white blood cells, it's like an army that goes and fights whatever it is that infected us, right? Um, has to respond and the immune, the immune cells, the white blood cells communicate with each other using chemical signals called cytokines. Some of those chemical signals are tailor-made to get rid of viruses, to kick viruses out of our bodies, you know, get a, do away with them. Now, the viruses that are able to tell the immune system, hey, don't produce those kinds of chemical signals, survive better. And so there's some um, evidence that this virus can in some ways change the way that our immune re system responds so that it's not as efficient as at getting rid of the virus, right? And so that means that when you're infected with a whole virus, even the parts of it that can dupe your immune system, you may not be able to make the same kind of immune response. Now, when we give a vaccine, we cut out all those other parts of the virus and we say, hey, this is the important part. You need to make an immune response to that. And then everyone who gets the vaccine makes neutralizing antibodies, right? So that's why the vaccine can more um, reliably produce the kind of immune response that will allow us to get rid of that virus. Perfect. I think it, we are all understanding, getting a, a way better understanding of how this uh, vaccination process works and how we do, how do we as humans work and how do we protect ourselves from, from disease and, and virus. Uh, this pandemic has affected women in, in so many ways and we all know this now from, from higher levels of unemployment to higher levels of domestic violence, uh, a, a higher workload and this is happening all over the world. In your experience, what has been the greatest impact of the pandemic has had on women? And, and how do you think we could address this? What can we learn from this? How can we um, try to make the life of women better and not worse because of, of this pandemic? Dr. Hussein, would you like to start answering this question? Yeah, sure. I think as we mentioned, COVID has clearly exacerbated and kind of further unmasked inequities that have already existed for a long time. And one of these is, you know, that of women in general. Historically, women tend to be more caretakers, are dealing with childcare in the house. And I think with COVID pushing all kids at home, that burden has really been placed on the women in the home to manage that load along with working from home and doing all the other responsibilities. And if there's anyone who's older that they're taking care of or their primary caretakers for, that has also increased that burden, right? Now they are not only taking care of people, but trying to figure out, well, what can I do safely without affecting everyone else in my household? Like, how can I go to the grocery store and make sure that I'm not going to affect the children in my home or the older adults in my home? And I think that has been such a huge thing that people have had to deal with and that hasn't been so clearly acknowledged. A lot of the times in science and medicine, we focus on the disease and the outcomes and the symptoms, but we don't focus and all the other things that happen, right? It's not just people who have COVID that are dealing with COVID, it's people who are trying to avoid getting COVID that are dealing with COVID. And these people are women, they're men, they're everybody, but it's a huge burden on just women in general trying to already balance all the responsibilities that they have. And I think that's kind of a big thing. And I think one of the ways to take away that burden is forums like this, where people can actually come and learn and make informed decisions for their household and for themselves because at the end of the day, everyone is just trying to provide the best care that they can. Um, and you can't do that if you don't know. And I am a firm believer that you should never just take whatever anyone says to you right away. Like 
feel free to double check everything that we've said here. I find no offense to that. I am all about empowering people to make the decisions that make them comfortable because at the end of the day, you are in charge of that. And if you're not feeling safe or feeling comfortable or feeling supported in that decision, then what are you gonna do, right? Um, and so for me, I think just allowing people the opportunity to ask their questions and to get them answered in a safe place is already a step in the right direction to help those women and lift that burden. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. Dr. Blazer, would you like to, to add something on, on that? Yeah, so I mean, I, I completely agree with, with uh, Dr. Hussain, and I think that um, there, there are several reasons why this affected women more. Um, one, because we are caregivers. Um, two, because uh, a lot of, so many, many people have unfortunately lost their jobs. Uh, many of the jobs that are gone are service jobs, jobs that involve restaurants, the public. We know that those jobs are more likely to be occupied by women um, and black and brown women or women of lower socioeconomic status. Um, I think the other thing is schools being closed means that children need to learn from home and a lot of that burden falls on mom, right? So a lot of women who, you know, if, if they have kept their jobs and are working from home and then have this added burden of also trying to be teacher and caregiver to these children, you know, I think it ends up being double duty, especially in societies that are highly patriarchal and have these uh, gender roles. And I think the other thing that's starting to come out is that um, there, there are these, there, there's this syndrome called long haul COVID. So there are people who get COVID and recover but then have symptoms for months thereafter, from headaches to weakness to dizziness, sometimes muscle aches. Uh, some people have, um, their hearts will go out of rhythm, so arrhythmias. Um, and there's this whole constellation of symptoms in people who have recovered from COVID. It turns out that that is much more common in, in women. So there was a study in the UK on long haul COVID, and it turned out that 80% of people who experience these uh, long term symptoms thereafter were women. So there may be a difference in the way that women's bodies respond to COVID, given that they hadn't recovered. Um, and then there may be some long term consequences to that. So there are a gamut of reasons why women are especially vulnerable during this pandemic. Perfect. Kenina, would you like to add something on that, on the burden this pandemic has put on women and how can we maybe try to learn something or how to address that? Um, I don't have much to add on to what everyone else has said so eloquently. Um, I will just say that one thing that has been on my mind has been the mental capacity of women who are these primary caretakers. I could not imagine having kids right now. I've had some friends who've had to make decisions to send their children to school. And the amount of fear and anxiety that comes with that, I can't imagine. But I also understand them also needing the time for themselves, also needing the time to, you know, go to work or just to be by themselves and have that that me time for their for their mental health and so i think the mental health burden on women is way you know has been really exacerbated and so i do like um a lot of the things that i've seen on social media that's really been centered around rest um but i have not that does not go to underestimate that rest is a privilege and um you know, my heart goes out to a lot of women. And you think about, we're talking about making, taking the vaccine for ourselves. You know, they're thinking about taking the vaccine for themselves. Also, is the vaccine safe for their children? They may have even recently had to make this decision depending on how old their children were. So it's just kind of like, I can't imagine all the type of decisions that they are making, that women, or I should say mothers are making, um, talking specifically about mothers. But yes, the, the, and like, like everyone else has said, like there has been some clinical differences between women. I do think though, I think I read this in a share, correct me if I'm wrong, that women are more likely to survive from the virus um, once they have gotten the virus. And I've seen a lot of data on that. I see you shaking your head, so I'm gonna go ahead and say it. <laughs> Uh, there's been a lot of data on that very early on and, and even now. 
Yes, I, I would like to, part, well, a big part of this conversation has been about trust and mistrust and how to navigate through misinformation and how to better educate ourselves. Uh, but we also know, we know, you know, that there are very real reasons why uh, people may feel a certain distrust on the health system in, in, in general. And this happens in communities that has, have been neglected or exposed to racism. And how would you speak to those people who, who feel distrust in the system and who per perhaps extend this, that distrust, distrust towards this vaccination process? So what would you tell them? I think the first thing that, oh, sorry, were you gonna say something, Shira? No, no, no. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I think one thing that's extremely important, and I've seen the chat kind of talk about this too. Um, I think the biggest mistake that we have, or I should say, um, scientists and, and medical professionals who are, well, I would just say that have what we, what we have been making the mistake we've been making for a long time is not acknowledging why. Why is there mistrust? And let's educate everyone on why that has happened. Uh, I tell people all the time, let's go back to the very first time an African descendant in America had engagement with the medical community. And those two instances, scenarios were either they were being used for some type of research study without consent, or they had to go to a doc. They were so sick that they had to go to a doctor so they could get back to work. And very recently, I thought about this. I said, well, that's not so different than where we are right now. I think a lot of people think that, well, maybe not so much the research part of it, but definitely the part of I, you know, I need to go to the doctor because I'm sick. That my, my mindset and mentality has stayed with us generations and generations and it's shaped because of our first engagement with medicine. Most black and brown people don't have the privilege of experiencing preventative care. And that is a socioeconomic issue, that is a racial issue. And so to neglect all of the history before it and to just say, well, why don't you just do this? Or why aren't you excited to take the vaccine? It's just really, uh, just really in a negligence of black and brown people's experience. And that's the same reason why we're here, right? And so instead of trying to, you know, ask that. So I hate when I see all the media that's like, well, if black people just participated in this study and there was more diversity or black people are afraid to take the vaccine is the highlight. That's, let's talk about why that is. Let's talk about the history that has formed this entire thing, right? Because if you go to different parts of the world where there are black and brown people, and I'm sure you can speak to this, we don't have, the experience and the fears are completely different. And so we need to really, really address this issue first. And let's talk about all the bad things that are happening. And then once we've done that, I think the next step is we need to acknowledge the pain. We need to, you know, be very compassionate about all the things that have happened. And now we need to talk about what are the real risk and possibilities, like we just talked about the vaccine harming a certain group. What are the real risk and possibilities that are specific to this thing that we've socialized as race. What are those things? And let's break that down and further understand it. We need to have a very honest conversation that's very transparent, that is accessible, right? For everyone to understand. And so that's how we kind of start to build trust. But I think to go back to your original question, we have to acknowledge why the lack of trust is there. We need to own it. Just like we've, a lot of people have recently started owning racism, right? Racism predates a lot of the things. Racism predates the field of genetics, right? So we, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right? Now let's talk about what are the effects of that, right? What are the effects of that that we're seeing now? And how does that help shape this distrust? An, an excellent answer. Dr. Hussein, please. Yeah, I was only going to say the only thing to add to that is like, Kind of like with my point earlier like this untrustworthiness is that like we have to acknowledge that we messed up as a medical community we have to just say that and we have to accept that because how are you going to trust someone who refuses to acknowledge something that they've done because they're just going to continue to deny and deny and deny so therefore you can't build trust when you can't even allow yourself to be fallible and so i think that 
is the issue. And I want, we like Dr. Jeff said, like, yeah, we want to think this is all historical, but even recently when we were talking about kind of rolling out these vaccines, there was a conversation about trying them out in different countries in Africa because they're like, well, let's see what happens there. And it's just like, what? Like, have you learned absolutely nothing? Like, how are you going to go somewhere else and use someone else's body because we have access to black and brown bodies here in this country and we've continued to use these people without consent and without verifying anything and say that you're gonna go somewhere else that didn't ask you to come over there that is not having as high rates of COVID and try out something new, right? Like you are not improving this idea, this vision that we as a medical profession are trustworthy because we're still making untrustworthy decisions. Now, granted, obviously that was shut down immediately, but those thoughts are still out there. And the only way to get those thoughts out is to continue to have these conversations and to continue to have brown and black folk who are in these positions of power who can help shape this conversation. Because when these vaccine trials started coming up even here and people were saying, well, how can we get people of color involved? I was like, I don't know, maybe try like not being shitty. And then maybe we can see how that works. Sorry, pardon the language, I apologize. I'm not always <laughs> professional. That's not the bias in, 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 in general. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, but you're so, so right. Like every time, uh, every time I have a meeting with some person in pharma, they're like, how do we get trust? How do we get involvement of black and brown people? And I I'm like, have you tried helping black people? And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> like I just, Anyway, um, no, I 100%. And I think also the other part of this narrative that always annoys me is that whenever we're like mistrust, the first thing people say is Tuskegee, right? And fine, yes, but it's so much deeper than that, right? As ta Coast said, race is not the father of racism. It is the son. Race was created due to racism and legitimizing race right, in order for us to perpetuate subjugation and genocide as an American people, we had to say races are inherently unequal and we are going to legitimize that by creating a structure that says these people are subhuman. Who did that? Science did, medical science did that, right? Legitimizing the, the idea that black bodies are different came from medicine. So the teeth behind slavery and structural racism came from medicine. And so it really is so much deeper than just saying, oh, Tuskegee happened, so we don't trust this or that, right? It's, it's this insidious experience that people have. This, this When people say, I don't trust the medical system, what they're saying is, I have never been treated like a human by this structure. Why should I expect this structure to treat me by, like a human today? And that's a much deeper conversation than this thing happened or that thing happened. Yeah. And I just want to add on to that. Um, everything you said, and also this uh, idea that medicine and scientists creating this pseudoscience called race is still being practiced today in medical research. People are still publishing papers trying to find out differences between ethnic groups. And ethnicity, ethnicity is a culture. It is not a biological thing that we can describe, right? We haven't even gotten to the point of changing the language. We put racism into science or science was created by racist people, right? And we have this pseudoscience there, but it still is here present day. And I can even tell you as a scientist being trained, I was being trained, not even realizing that racism was embedded in a lot of the things that I was studying and a lot of the ways that I thought about these questions. And the reason, another reason why is because, you know, I'm also so socialized around race, it's hard for me to even think about a world and thinking and operate in a way where it doesn't exist. And that's unfortunate and that's sad. But everything uh, that Dr. Blazer said, one thing that we have to continue to do because it is still happening is distinguish pseudoscience from actual science and, and take apart the social the things that we've put on top of it, right? How we've socialized science into these horrible things. Yeah, I, I really, I can't thank you enough for sharing all these views uh, with us for showing us all the all the layers in these conversations. No, this is 
this is not about a, about a virus, a virus only. This is about this is about humans. This is about us and and the things that we create and the way we address uh, these challenges. I, I I just have a couple more questions tonight, and I want to change a little bit the subject a little bit. And we live in a time that demands great uh, precautions, great sacrifices. Uh, we're in December. This is uh, the time of, this is the end of the year, a time of celebrations, family, reunion, parties, hacks. What recommendation would you give us? Uh, and, and if that's okay with you, could you tell us how, with, with your expertise, with the information that you have, with your knowledge, how you have decided to spend the holidays. Yeah, so I can go first. So I'm Muslim, but Christmas is my favorite holiday. As y'all can see the decorations behind me, I'm literally obsessed. Um, and I usually save the last two weeks of December because it's also my birthday to go see my family. Fortunately, my family is in Florida. And as we know, those cases have not improved and the precautions in Florida are not as up to par in other places. Um, and so I won't be going home and I won't be seeing them this year. And although my mom threatened to disown me, I think now she has realized that obviously it is an unsafe thing to do. So when I talk to people, I do not diminish, like diminish the fact how important it is for us to be close to our loved ones. And I understand that. And that is not a science thing. It is a mental thing. It is a life thing, right? We all wanna be close to those that we love. But unfortunately, given this time period, there's really not a great safe way to do this, right? So even if you are getting tested, that test is just a snippet in time, right? So we don't know if you are gonna get infected after that or on your plane ride or on the road trip when you stop to talk to that person in the gas station, right? We have no idea the level of infection that you can get in those places. And so a test in itself is not predictive of you continuing to be safe when you gather with your loved ones. The second thing is if that is, and you need to see your family and you just have to do that, totally understandable. I would say the safest way to go about that is not only to get tested, but then to quarantine for two weeks. And by quarantine, I mean like legit quarantine, not like, well, I'm quarantining, but I'm gonna go see this like friend who lives next door because obviously the germs are like right there. Like legitimate quarantine for 14 days and get a test to make sure that you're negative prior to you leaving. Once you're meeting with your family, you want them also to have quarantined for the same amount of time. Because we have seen, as I've mentioned prior, that a lot of spread is with these family gatherings. Because as much as we like to think we're being safe, there's no way you're gonna be six feet away from your cute old granny who wants to give you a kiss. And there's no way she's gonna kiss you with that mask on, right? So we already know that those things are coming down and we have to accept that. And to realize the risk, we have to acknowledge that we are taking these risks. So for people who are planning to travel or people who wanna see and still gather with their family, while I strongly rec not, don't recommend it, if you are gonna do it, the safest way is to do that quarantine and get that test. And on your return, I also would recommend quarantining if you think you've had an exposure, for seven days and towards the end of that seven days, maybe day five to seven, get a test because by that time you should have enough virus in order to actually detect that safely. Um, so that would be my recommendation. If you do not plan on getting a test, you don't have access to that test, then quarantine for 10 days. Um, and by that time, any symptoms that you had or any infectious like ability that you had should be gone. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still a risk. So, you know, be safe distance if you can, be outside if you can, wear a mask if you can, whether or not you're vaccinated. The one thing I think that we didn't touch on completely here because it's kind of complicated is the fact that even with vaccines, we don't really know what the transmission is gonna be. So even if you are vaccinated, it does not mean you will not have a low level of virus that you can transmit to somebody else. Um, it just means that you are not gonna experience the disease to its extent or actually have symptoms that arise, but you could still have a low level enough to infect somebody else. So I think that is also important because just because of healthcare, healthcare workers are getting vaccinated does not mean we're going to be out there partying as much as we want because we still understand that that risk is unknown and the long-term effects of that immunity, just the immunity of that vaccine is unclear. So. Right. Thank you. Dr. Blazer. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Hussein's family is in Florida. My family is in Texas and Louisiana. Same sis. <laughs> like, so I'm, you know, I'm not going home. Uh, this is actually the first Christmas that I have not spent with my family, um, but I'm not going home. Uh, luckily, my parents are my parents are not the sentimental type at all. Like, <laughs> like I, I've done like an MD and a master's and like subspecialty. And like the last time I was going to graduate, I was like, "Hey, mom, I'm graduating from fellowship. Do you want to come for my graduation to New York from Texas?" And she was like, 
you always graduating from shit. I can't just hop up every time you graduate, you know? <laughs> I'm like, okay, you, you do not have parenting problems. <laughs> But anyway, the point is my parents are okay with me not visiting and like not getting them sick. Um, I think we may do Zoom or something like that. Uh, my significant other has family here, uh, but I think, so we visited some of his family for Thanksgiving and like I'd gotten tested, some of them had gotten tested. But then when we got there, like there's one family member who like this little girl and she was so adorable and she's like i want to take selfies together and she's like sitting in my lap and being all closed and i'm like oh my god this is not safe at all but i'm way too southern to be like hey get out of here little girl right like she's like a cute little precious thing thank god nothing happened but i think that experience just taught me like even small gatherings are are probably not okay so i think what's gonna happen is gonna hang back hopefully by the time you know February, March rolls around more people can be vaccinated and maybe I'll take like spring trips or something like that. But for now, I think it's going to be distance loving for Christmas. Huh? Sounds very reasonable. And Janina, what are you going to do for Christmas? And what um, would you recommend? Yeah. yeah, so I've already learned this lesson the hard way and I'll tell you um, for Thanksgiving. So I actually relocated for the winter because I decided this year that New York winter was a choice that I no longer want to participate in. <laughs> Heard you guys got snow. Um, so I came back <laughs> to my hometown, New Orleans, Louisiana, which is where I was born and raised. Um, and because I was moving for six months, I drove down and on the way down, I stopped in Atlanta where my mother and sister live. Um, for Thanksgiving. And I didn't talk about this, but I had the virus in April and um, did have antibodies, no longer have antibodies. And I knew that I was going to be traveling this long trip to New Orleans from New York. And so being the crazy person that I am, and then also having a crazy friend like Ashira to assist and support my craziness, I have been getting tested. I, I I would say at least monthly, if not more. Um, and because I knew I would be traveling, even though, you know, I felt like, well, anyway, I knew that, um, I knew that I would be traveling. So I had looked at my map and I had found all of these, um, what do they call it? Um, walk-in clinics, right? Uh, minute clinic, just so you guys know, they all offer rapid testing. And so I wasn't also excited about getting my nostrils disrespected every time I wanted to get a test. And so I was all about the rapid testing and which is not as invasive or it shouldn't be if people are properly trained. And I had figured out how I was going to get tested everywhere that I went, you know, along this trip. Um, and so I did get tested once before going to Atlanta. Long story short, as soon as I got to New Orleans the Sunday after Thanksgiving, my mom calls me and is like, I'm feeling sick. And then on that Monday, she tested positive for the virus. And I was one of the few people that she had saw that week. Um, and, you know, thinking about all the tracing. And I will say, I don't know who it was, but before I left New York, someone else I had come in contact with also tested for the virus. And New York Health has been calling me and then they transferred it to Louisiana. So I will say the tracers are on it. Um, and so I've actually come in contact with the virus twice in the same week after Thanksgiving. And I can tell you the amount of fear and anxiety that came over me when my mom tested positive, I do not recommend. It is not worth it. It is not worth it. Um, that being said, because I am home, I haven't actually decided if I would go back to Atlanta to see my mother, because now that she's had it, I don't know, I haven't decided yet. Um, but I'm more than likely going to stay put. I just say that to say that I, you know, I tried it. I was trying to be safe. People still got sick. So I say that to say you can even do all the safety measures that you want. Um, there's still that chance. There is that risk and there is no risk in staying at home. But we are human, so you know, please make whatever decisions you know you feel is best for you. So I'm kind of undecided right now with what I'm gonna do. I have family here, so if I decide to stay here, it's fine too. Well, thank you. Thank you, Yanina. Thanks for sharing this. And 
And well, and that's the kind of friendship that we all need, you know, the friends that support us in craziness <laughs> and, and not in craziness. So, so that's that's great. And and we hope your mom is is uh, of course. Yeah, she's doing great. Glad to hear that. So. Well, this is my last question, and it's also related to the end of the year. I would like to know, what do you expect for 2021? Some people say it should be better. It can get any worse than 2020, but we don't know. So what do you expect? Or what would you like to see in 2021? Uh, I guess I can go. Um... Well, first of all, I don't like saying it can never get worse because I'm very superstitious. Um, so I don't put that out there. <laughs> um, <Sorry>. but, <laughs> but that's a personal problem. Um, but I will say, you know, despite all of the negative impact that COVID has, I'm hoping that 2021, we can see some of the positive impact in the fact that it has highlighted, like we mentioned, a ton of inequities, a ton of policy deficits, a ton of healthcare issues that really have been there but have never been addressed. And so my hope is that as we move towards the future, we are actually acknowledging and working on policies to improve this foundation that is clearly so cracked and was so weakened by a virus, right? So if we can fall apart for one virus, we can fall apart for anything. And I think the important thing to realize is that with increasing biodiversity and industrialism, we are gonna see more viruses that we aren't accustomed to and more combinations and maybe more shifts. And it's not a matter of if, but really a matter of when. And if we realize that now, we can maybe for once be proactive um, and refuel those organizations and those groups that were doing that work, that were in other countries, testing and making sure new things didn't pop up and actually focus on those so that we can improve our outcomes as we go forward. Because I think having a false hope that this is one thing we've conquered it, we're done, is not gonna help us move forward. We need to consistently be aware and we need to be ready to move on to what comes next. And I think that is what I hope for the future. That and that everybody gets vaccinated and we can all see each other's faces again out of Zoom. Yeah, so I will say, I'm gonna split this into hopes and fears, all right? So my hopes, my hope is that people get vaccinated, we get past this, we get to the critical mass of 70% vaccination, which is like the herd immunity where the number of spreading cases goes down. Um, that we all, I think one of the, silver linings to making sacrifices is that we are able to sow gratefulness, right? The next time that I see my father and my mother, I am going to be so grateful. The next time I get to hug my sister, I am going to be so grateful and I'm going to cherish it in ways that I didn't before this happened. And so I just really am looking forward to the amount that we can appreciate those little parts of our lives that make it special. And so, um, so that's what I'm looking forward to. That's my hope. My fear is that we are gonna see some of the same patterns here that we have seen in other infectious epidemics, meaning there are always disparities and then a, an effective treatment comes out and then disparities get wider right? Um, people who are black and brown don't get the same access, don't have the same trust, aren't able to, don't have the insurance, all these things to have access to a highly effective therapy or a vaccine. And the difference between, you know, black and brown communities and majority communities widens and widens. And I think that's something, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm here tonight is because I don't want to see that happen. And to the extent that I can impress upon you that this is something that can be done safely and administered safely. And you can take that information back to your communities. Um, you know, I'm here for it. So um, those, are, those are my thoughts for 2021. Let's, I'm, I'm gonna say we're gonna be more on the hope side than the fear side. Yeah. I just wanna say, I'll, I'll try and be optimistic. Um, <laughs> I'll try and be optimistic uh, and pick some safe things. So one thing I can say is that this has changed us socially and as a society. And just to give a shout out to Women X and platforms like this, it's been such a joy to see how much we can make things accessible to everyone in the virtual space at a very quick pace. 
it's been so good to see that. So one of the things I like about, or one of the things I should say has happened as a good sign of COVID um, is the fact that most of, you know, we have so much access to events like these, you know. Uh, one of the reasons why I moved to New York is because a lot of the events were in New York. And now I live in this world where a lot of the events are everywhere. And that's amazing because now everyone has access to so much. It's changed the way we, you know, watch movies now, right? It's changed the way every, it changes the way we've socialized. It changes the way we work, like working, the work culture has changed now forever, right? Um, and, and a lot of people don't realize this. I want to talk about the work thing just for one second. I've had a lot of friends, especially, uh, I have a lot of friends, Black friends, um, who have all talked about how grateful they are to be able to work from home. And one of the things I will say, it really has highlighted the amount of uh, trauma that Black people deal with when working with working in, in the workforce and being able to be home and be protected from that trauma in your safe space has changed the game for a lot of us. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Um, I've been working from home for five years, so my experience is a little bit different, but everyone else is now working from home and experiencing the same thing. And so... I definitely think we need to advocate for that. And I think it also makes accessible a different wave of jobs for everyone, right? And I think it definitely changes the workforce. Like, you know, making people move to a place that they don't want to live for a job is no longer going to be a thing. Um, in terms of the virus itself, so things that I am afraid of, and Ashir and I talked about this, I am afraid of the we running out of the vaccine. I am afraid of us running out of the vaccine, us, a lot of us saying, oh, I'm gonna wait for you to take it, I'm gonna wait for you to take it, and we're gonna do all this waiting, and because the government didn't purchase enough of the vaccine, and because we don't have choice in the type of vaccine we can get, we are gonna be the ones left with the little vaccine that's left, if that, and I don't want people, you know, as we start to go back to work, and as we start to, you know, open things up, there will be restrictions on people who are vaccinated, there will be restrictions on people who have some type of immunity versus those who don't and I don't want people to go out there to get sick to accomplish immunity um, in the case that they don't get the vaccine and so I really do hope that the narrative changes but I do foresee us running out of the vaccine and I do see a lot of black and brown people being the people healthy black and brown people being the people who are not vaccinated and that scares the shit out of me um in terms of other things that I see um uh, yeah, I think that's it. I think I kind of did the same thing you did this year. I gave you guys some hope and then scared you a little. Uh, <laughs> but one thing I am looking forward to in 2021 is some new, um, new government. One more thing I was going to say, though, um, that I think is really exciting. COVID has sped up uh, vaccine research in a way that's unprecedented. And I think it has now shaped a new possibility for vaccines for things like the common cold. And for and, and I'm excited to see the science that's going to prevent the next pandemic, because now it's on everyone's radar that this could happen again. I just hope and pray in 30 years that people are still you know, keen on all the things that we need to be doing in order to prevent these things from happening. And don't get me started on how we need to take better care of the earth and that whole bandwagon. I know you don't want to hear that. But the point is, is I really hope that this helps us learn to create new, va um, create vaccines and vaccine research for other um, viruses to come. I hope it really changes that. And I also hope that it changes the way we care about each other, the way we care about the earth and all these things that impact what we've seen in 2020. Yeah, well, wow, that's a lot, a lot of wishes. And I think we all, <laughs> we all share those which, wishes. Doctors, Doctors Ashira Blazer, A.B. Hussein, Jenny Najef. It's been it's been a pre uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. It's been a privilege to be part of this conversation. And I I want to thank you for your your intelligence, your honesty, your sharpness, and your kindness. Thank you so 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 much. And back to Mary. Wow. Thank you so much for having us.